has been going on for decades. And if you know mathematics, what do you have when you have a linear function? If that continues a couple more decades, how many people in the United States will be treated with medication? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> I love graphs. Where is the asymptote? There is not one in this graph. It has to happen sometime, right? Well, I thought it happened. In one of the surveys from 90, 90, uh, uh, 87 to 96, you know, things going up, both for adolescents and, and children, and then it looked like it leveled off in children to 2002. My colleague uh, Ben Vitello, who's part of the MTA, I thought it was a great article. I said, oh, relief, finally, asymptote. I love graphs. This is a nonlinear. Uh, then I decided to look what happened after 2002. This is from the WHO production records. It looks like there's an asymptote. Uh-oh. It's continuing to go up. This is the UK. And I actually have one for Sweden, too. You can, you can calculate these if you want. They're, they're free. I'm on the list. I get the report every year of the production of methylphenidate and amphetamine in the world, and it lists by country. Uh, but is that going to stop? Why has it continued to go up from 2002 to 2005? And I also, is there a problem? Actually, this is a plot of the number of prescriptions and the supply and the actual concern I have is the supply is going up faster than the prescriptions. I'm a little worried about diversion, but probably this is just related to higher doses being given. Uh, these are calculated in defined daily dose, so you can compare across countries. So the defined daily dose of methylphenidate is 30 milligrams by conventions, uh, 15 milligrams for amphetamine. So you can compare, even though there's a lot of difference, the big differences in UK and the US, this is the defined daily dose. So this tells me how many doses are available to be used to treat the population of the United States, which is pretty high. Defined daily dose, production's going up, prescription's going up. And this is very interesting. These are prescription records uh, that have gone on since 2002. Where's the big increase? There is an asymptote, and there's not. For children, no change. This is the number of prescriptions, millions in the United States. What about adolescents? It's going up every year. What about young adults? And there are a lot of old adults from 25 up versus the restriction in five-year blocks here. But we got this increase that's continuing to go up with the older groups. So that increase, this linear, is still linear, but not for the same reasons. Who are we treating now? Where's the big growth market in the United States for stimulants? Adolescents and adults. <coughs> Children level off. Uh, this is eye-opening. This article by Gu just published this year based on survey in the United States of all drugs prescribed. This is just a survey of the United States, a very good national survey of asking, do you take any, do you have any prescriptions? What's in your medicine cabinet? If they say, well, I do take prescriptions, they read off what's in the medicine cabinet. So we track in the United States what drugs are prescribed. What do you think the most frequently prescribed class of medication is, is for, for adolescents in the United States? CNS stimulants. More frequent than asthma drugs. So this, and I think that what people are, are worried about now is, uh, are we just treating ADHD? Or are many adolescents who are trying to get into good colleges, are college students trying to get better? Not because they have a disorder, not to correct a deficit, they're trying to get the edge. And uh, we're concerned, and some, some people are concerned, 
that this is happening in the United States, that stimulants might be for everybody. Actually, I don't think so. I think if you don't have ADHD in a deficit, you probably don't get it better. You think you do, but your perception's wrong. The very first dose of amphetamine ever taken when it was synthesized, you know, the person who synthesized it took it and wrote a journal, and the person who was with him kept a journal, and an hour after he got it, he said, there was a fine sense of well-being. I think I'm good. And the person watching him say, what? <laughs> you're not. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the things in normals. When you take it, you think you're doing better on reading and cramming for tests and even tests. But there is no clear evidence that you are doing better. In some things you do better, in some things you don't. Maybe in low-level rote tasks you do and high-level tasks you don't. So there's lack of information on this, but the turbocharging of the brain is, uh, this was a, a Scientific American article, really a great article if you want, very scholarly article in a, in a popular magazine. Uh, this writer is fantastic, Gary Sticks. He's written, if you just follow his uh, career of what he's written, I've never seen somebody work so hard to do a good job of writing articles, not only on this topic, most any topic. But this is a fantastic article uh, if you want to take a look at it. Uh, and these are the issues about whether there is cognitive enhancement with stimulants in normal people and whether these drugs should not be controlled, but they should be open for anybody to use. And this is where the neuroethics come in. This is the ethical question. Should you have laws that are routinely broken? It's against the law to take stimulants if you don't have a prescription. High percentage of college students do. Is that reasonable <clears throat> in the United States? That's, these are ethical questions. I don't know whether that's unethical or not. It's just an ethical question. Uh, <clears throat> well, we should know what happens in the brain if a lot of adults and adolescents are taking this. And one of the places where we find out what happens in the brain when you take stimulants is here at the Karolinska. Well, that's not the only place, but it is one of the leading places. Uh, I looked up positron emission tomography, which is the way you do this, in my number one trusted source. <laughs> How many of you use Wikipedia? <laughs> I love Wikipedia. <laughs> and here's the history of PET. In the 70s, Brookhaven National Laboratory was the first to describe the synthesis of FDG. <laughs> Tried, even though a lot of the things were invented here and done here. Uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory is a really good place to do PET imaging. Uh, and particularly with uh, glucose utilization, the, the energy source of the brain. Uh, this is uh, the two leaders of that group. This is Joanna Fowler. This is our president. Every year, 10 scientists across the United States are selected as the best scientists in the United States. They get a medal of, a medal of science from uh, the president. Last year, Joanna got a medal. And at the same time, Mike Posner got a medal. So of the 10 scientists in the United States doing good work, two of them are studying ADHD. Mike Posner, a neuropsychologist, and Joanna Fowler, who is really the, the radiochemist who deals with uh, the uh, pet imaging facility at Brookhaven. And this is Nora Volko, who uh, together they run the pet uh, lab with many other people, a, a big staff. I think this is the original pet imager. That's not the one we use now. Uh, but this is uh, the leaders of the group. And we do pet imaging of all sorts uh, with different uh, radio tracers to look at dopamine transporter levels, to look at receptor density to look at glucose utilization. I'll just make one point, then I'll stop. Uh, back in the 99, there was a report that uh, the, a group said that there was a 70% increase in age-corrected dopamine transporter density in patients with ADHD compared to healthy control. If that's the case, then we have almost a perfect way to diagnose the disorder. An effect that big, which was several standard deviations, would be a fantastic achievement. And actually, I wrote a letter to the editor of this, too. I, I write a lot of letters to the editor. I said, this is really fantastic if it's true. But you need a lot of scrutiny because this would be very important. This would be a diagnostic test for ADHD. Well, 
we didn't get the first study, unfortunately. We were working away and somebody else said, well, maybe it's not so. Uh, maybe there is something not uh, uh, different about the way the imaging is done. Uh, this study said that maybe the, uh, the, the effect was not there. This one said the same thing. And finally, our study came out. Uh, it took us eight years to do this study of drug-naive adults with ADHD. And what did we find? Here is a pet image of a control subject of ADHD subject. The, the color coding red means high density. Who's the highest? Not the ADHD subject. So density is actually lower of the dopamine transporter, a major way the drug works in the brain. Uh, and uh, we don't find that there is any effect uh, that, that replica we don't replicate the effect of a high density of the dopamine transporter, the etiology of ADHD. Recently, we've gone up to a large number of patients, over 50, and we published this paper where we looked at different areas of the brain. And we looked at both the, uh, kind of the ADHD as a motivation deficit as well as an attention deficit by focusing on the mesial cumbens area, the network of the brain associated with reinforcement and reward, instead of the caudate sort of linked into a network associated with attention. Uh, so we're looking at the motivation aspect and the attention aspect of ADHD. Here's a normal subject, ADHD subject, the same thing. We find lower density of the dopamine transporter. But when we look at specific areas, when we try to look at both the caudate and the nucleus accumbens, we're seeing if there are differences when we can look at those in these different parts of the brain associated with different processes, motivation versus attention. And what we found, both for transporter density, overlaid, Look at the difference in motivation and attention. Controls versus ADHD. We're finding lower in both networks associated with motivation as well as attention. And the same thing for, for uh, uh, looking at the receptor availability. Uh, most recently, we followed up individuals who were not treated as adults. We treated them for a year. And then we found over time that actually at baseline, after treatment for a year, the density color-coded here goes up after treatment. So we think the dopamine system is very plastic, as many of the studies here have suggested as well, and that you may get a change in the brain with long-term treatment, with chronic treatment. So we're very interested in what happens to adults, and adults that let us get treated for a long period of time with a drug that has a very potent effect on dopamine in the brain. And we do think there is plasticity in that system that may be altered with long-term treatment. And I don't have enough time to go over all the details of the other things I was going to cover, so I'll just stop there saying that uh, the, the uh, uh, ADHD treatment in the long term probably doesn't have much of an effect, no benefit relative to other treatments after three years, but it has very potent effects immediately and next day, as I say, next month, next year. It's one of the best treatments for ADHD there is. And I've done a lot of work on pharmacological interventions over my career. So I can, uh, I'm not, a, I am a proponent of medication when it, but I need to think we should describe what it does accurately. It has an effect that probably is an acute effect. It's not going to have much of an effect over the lifetime when a person's older. And it may actually lose its effectiveness over time. That's a question that we're addressing. But the immediate effect is pronounced. It's the best treatment over the first 14 months in the MTA. It's still the best after two years, but less so. There's no difference after three years and on out. And we don't find any protection effect, so we shouldn't be putting our hopes on protecting children against substance use or delinquency by treating with medication. We should be having other treatments that are targeted to protect children from those very detrimental outcomes. And I think I'll stop there, uh, giving you a summary of sort of my views on the uh, diagnosis of ADHD, which is advertised in the title. The MTA, a quick summary, something about the brain imaging, affects what happens in the brain when you're treated with uh, stimulant drugs. Thank you. Uh.